you evaluate this product, you know, how come um, it's just omega p not um, the square? Like, it seems like the delta function evaluates p or k. You know, it evaluates p or k. Well, the delta function does, in an integral, force p yeah. over k. But so, but they didn't like. But you no, but that's a, well. I mean, I can. Yeah. All right, let me. Why don't you sit down and here. Um, I guess you might as well start it or have yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so the question was, let me pull my notes so that I don't um, get, uh, well, in fact, let me, let me um, start, start, the class, start the class at a point uh, which was 90% um, the, the 0.9 part of the previous lecture. In other words, I'm going to review the last tenth. Um, in particular, one thing that we had was that a dagger of p on zero on the vacuum is one over square root of two omega p times the state of uh, one particle momentum p. We take the norm of the vacuum to be one. But now when we take the inner product of two states, k and p, what do we get? We get two, you see p is two, this would be two, well, not two, it would be square root of two omega p, um, zero a p, taking the adjoint of this equation. And then we would have an a dagger of k. So this thing is that on vacuum times the square root of 2 omega k. All right. So this thing is 2 square root of omega p omega k times vacuum. Now we know what this commutator is. Well, it's not a commutator, this product, because we know that a p AK dagger commutator is, is the delta function and in the norm, in Schwartz's norms, 2 pi q. So this is equal to 2 pi q delta p minus k um, plus a, AK dagger AP. On the other hand, this thing between two vacuum states just gives zero. And so what we have then is um, simply uh, vacuum vacuum, which is one, two pi q delta of p minus k. Okay, which is, uh, now that's one, and so this is two omega p uh, 2 pi q delta p minus k. Now, this tells you two things. This says that the states k are not normalized. At least they're not normalized to unity. They're normalized in this funny delta function normalization. Um, and now what do you what do you do with it? Well, what happens is this will occur later inside integrals. And those integrations, which would be horribly difficult, become terribly simple because of the delta function. So you may, the first few times you see a delta function, you think of it as um, something frightening. After a while, you'll learn that delta functions are your friends. Okay. Dirac is your friend. His delta functions are your friends. In fact, a little later in the, in the lecture, 
Anthony tell you a story about fear. Um, well, I have many stories about fear. But anyway. Okay, so uh, any other questions? Yes. Uh, no, thank you. I was about to say there's a great deal of hunger in this class. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, maybe we'll get to this later in the course, but how do you deal with the problem of the fact that you have this zero point energy for all of the field nodes? This is the, one of the most difficult problems in physics. In string theory, you can, um, you can deal with it, but on the other hand, we've had nearly 30 years of string theory and people aren't sure which of the 10 to the Google theories is the right one. Okay. But um, you, you, you just have to deal with the problem of infinities. And it turns out that there's something really funny going on um, that's been tantalizing people in physics for decades, since the uh, invention of supersymmetry back in the 50, 30s, no, not the 30s, not 50, the 60s, I think, it was invented uh, first in Russia and then uh, in the US, um, back more or less in the 60s. And um, what happens is the zero point energy of fermionic fields is negative and also quartically divergent. And so people realized then that if you had an exact pairing of fields, the same mass and so forth, this is called exact supersymmetry. If you had exact supersymmetry, then um, the zero point energy would, be, would vanish. And um, the problem is that well, it was well expressed. I don't know if I told you all guys this. That I remember years ago I was visiting Berkeley and uh, uh, there was a conference scheduled. And the conference was supersymmetry confronts experiment. And there was a, an 8.5 by 11 sheet on the bulletin board advertising the conference. And someone had written on it, Experiment 10, supersymmetry zero. <laughs> um, and that's because there's been no sign experimentally of supersymmetry. And supersymmetry for every particle, you have a partner of exactly the same mass, but spin different by a half. We don't see that. So, um, I don't know. I've been actually working on this problem. Not the supersymmetry route, but another route. And David has been working. Um, but it's it's um, the my suspicion is that dark energy is just you know you solve the problem of uh, the zero point energies and the energy of the vacuum is whatever the energy of the ground state of quantum field theory is. Um, but I don't know, that may be, may be true, may not be true, probably is. But. All right, so what we saw also last time was that the one particle identity operator is pqp over 2 pi cubed. PQ, this, is an, this isn't pxp, this is my lazy way of writing the outer product of two p states um, divided by two omega p. Okay, now let's see. All right, our uh, field, which we can think of as a a free field at say time zero, position x, we're writing it this way. dqp 2 pi cubed, 1 over square 2 omega p, a sub p, e to the i, p dot x, plus a gaga of p, e to the minus i, p dot x. 
one of the disadvantages of um, the metric Schwartz uses is that this p dot x comes in with a minus sign in the Lorentz in the product. So we'll get to that uh, later. Um, the p that occurs here is, um, if you want, it's p mu and it's omega p, p vector. And uh, if the field is massless, omega p, or let me just write it more generally, it's the square of the momentum plus the square of the mass. And of course, I've said c equal to 1 because I don't know where to put c, what the powers are of c without working it out. All right, I'm joking. It's not that bad. Um, now, what we want for a massless field is we want box phi equal to zero. That's a Lorentzian variant equation. And we'll uh, satisfy that if we have, if we say that A of P of T is in fact um, E to the minus I omega T. And uh, so then our field is P of then say X and T, or just writing X and T as a full vector X. This is an integral dQ P over 2 pi Q uh, root 2 omega P. So then it's A T at time zero, e to the minus i omega t plus i p dot x plus a p dot x e to the i omega t minus i p dot x. And of course, if we write this as an inner product in the Lorentz invariant sense, then this is integral t cubed p over 2 pi cubed square root 2 omega p, so we then have a p e to the minus i p x plus a dagger p e to the i p x. So that's a nice way of writing it in the Lorentz invariant. Okay. All right, now we want to see that, um, that the time derivative of phi is actually given by the commutator of phi with the Hamiltonian. So let's do that. What we'll do is we'll take um, H0 phi of x and t. Well, this is an integral, or first a commutator of an integral H. H0 means the Hamiltonian for the freely interacting uh, field. And um, by the way, the, the equation for mass of field is just box plus n squared p. Anyway, this is dq p 2 pi q omega p a p dagger a p plus a half. And we're commutating that with this which is integral, let us say, d to k, 2 pi q, square root of 2 omega k, and then we have a k e uh, to the minus i kx, where um, this is an <coughs> inner product of two four vectors, and a k, I'm following the book very closely, so don't need to take notes to copy down everything I write. Okay, well, both of these have non-zero commutators with a dagger a, but of course, one half doesn't play a role at all in the commutator. And the fundamental commutation relation, well, it's written up here, isn't it? And in fact, this will be an example of what you were asking. Okay. Um, and uh, so what do we have? What we have, and I see that I, I basically did, I skipped that line when I wrote my notes. 
Um, so let me put it in in uh, detail. So this then is an integral dqp, and we've got 2 pi to the 6. We've got an omega p, and we've got a 1 over square root of 2 omega k, and we've got a cos of dqp. Okay. Right, I think I've got all those factors. Right. Then what do we have left? We have the commutator of AP dagger AP with AK times e to the minus i KX plus the commutator of AP dagger AP with AK dagger times e to the i KX. Okay. Now, um, the AP is just a spectator here, and so if to save, I mean, these equations can get very lengthy. So just to save the strength in my arms, I'm going to write this as AK times AP. And A dagger, of course, commutes with A dagger P. And so I'm going to write this as A dagger P times AP with A dagger K. And then we know what those are. If AP with A dagger K is 2 pi cubed delta P minus K, 3 vector, period. And so this is, so if I just do the surgery on this, the 2 pi cubed is going to change the 6 into a 3. And then instead of this, we're just going to have delta cubed of P minus K here times A of P minus I K X. And then over here, we're going to have AP dagger e to the i k x. And the 2 pi came out. Uh, but this one, notice it's in the wrong order. So this is a minus sign. Uh, delta q of p minus k. So basically, the way to read this is dqp, dqk, 2 pi cubed, omega p over 2 omega k times the delta function times ap minus a dagger, ap e v i k x minus a dagger p e v i k x. All right, so what does that give us? Well, I've got some space here, so let me say what it gives us. Obvi the delta function then, the integral dk over the delta function forces, just evaluates everything at k equal to p. And so every time we see a k, we replace it by a p. And in particular, there's a k here, becomes a p, and so the thing cancels and the dqk goes away. And so what we have is dqp over 2 pi cubed. We then have a, um, well, I'm going to uh, write it in a funny sort of way. I would have canceled these, but I'm instead going to leave them the way they are. 2 omega p. And now what we've got is uh, a p e to the minus i k, e to the minus i p x. And if I write this more explicitly, what it is, it's e to the minus i uh, omega p t plus i p dot x. And then the other one is minus a p dagger. And this is e to the i omega p t minus i p dot x. So that's what we've got for the commutator of h0 with phi. And now we see that this is just i times the derivative of the field. Because if you, um, this almost looks like a complex conjugate, so let me get rid of it. 
if you take the derivative of this, this pulls down a minus i, you multiply by an i, that turns into a plus, and that's this omega p. And then on the other hand, you take the derivative here, and that brings down i omega. If you multiply by i, then you get a minus i. So this is equal to i d by dt of phi of x and t. So in fact, we have the fundamental uh, relation, which I guess is a Heisenberg equation of motion. It's h0 phi of x and t is, uh, now I see it's minus i d by dt of phi of x and t. And I'm a little bit puzzled to see why there's a minus sign here. Oh, it's, it's, I got these commutators exactly backwards. It's a a dagger that's one. So this one has a minus sign and this one has a plus sign. And see, it's this general thing that I've told you so many times. When my left hand is, at the arm is straight, you have to watch out. I can make mistakes. All right, so this is the Heisenberg equation of motion. Um, interacting fields. Well, by and large, you can um, you can say that uh, an interacting field. In other words, we've been looking at a free field theory here that was massless or massive. The calculation would have been uh, the same. If we imagine we're talking about um, a more complicated field theory of a scale field, then typically what you have is that phi of x and t is an integral, and it would again be dqp over 2 pi cubed square root of 2 omega p. But now it would be a p of t e to the minus i p x plus a dagger p of t e to the i p x. In other words, it would be an extra t dependence. And so what you have, um, what you have actually is, is, it's as simple as possible. In other words, you have a k dagger at the same time is again the same thing as that. In other words, 2 pi q delta q of uh, p minus k. Questions? All right, let's look at the low energy limit of this. This may be the most puzzling thing of the whole chapter to you. But um, remember we had that, um, we were saying that phi of x and t on um, uh, the vacuum state, we were saying, well, this is the state x. And I guess I would say, I guess I'll have to put a t in there somewhere. So we can say then that xt is uh, 0 phi of x and t. Phi being Hermitian. Okay, take Hermitian conjugate of this just comes back as, uh, to itself. And um, we want to think in terms of um, quantum mechanics and we'll say that some state psi of x, the wave function, is the unit product of x with uh, that state or of this of time t is, is that in a product. And what's the time derivative of that? Well, what we would have then is i, let me just write it as psi dot, it's, it's a little easier. And let me just write it as x instead of x and t. Then this thing is the time derivative of, of, of this, and so this will be i, well, I'm, I'm having to do a time derivative anyway. 0, phi of x and t 
and whatever the state sign is. And of course, the, this is the same thing as, I didn't really need to do that, so I'll put the dot in there. And um, what do we know? Well, we know that the field equation is, let us say this is a massive field, so it's box plus m squared phi is equal to zero. And so what is box? Well, box, remember, Schwartz has the minus sign on all the space derivatives. So this is d by dt squared minus grad squared plus m squared phi is zero. And so d by dt squared on phi is grad squared minus m squared on phi. And in particular, d by dt on phi, well, that just brings down uh, a minus i omega. And omega is the square root, omega p is the square root, of course, of p squared plus m squared. And so this thing here, the i side dot, of x then is, and now I'm going to write out this phi dot like this, it's vacuum integral dqp 2 pi q square root of 2 omega p, and now this is omega p here, so that's square root of p squared plus m squared, I'm writing it explicitly, and then we have ap e to the minus i p x minus a dagger sub p e to the i p x and then the state sign, whatever that may be. And so in other words, i on this, i times minus i is plus one, that brought down omega p, that's the omega p uh, sitting there. But now we're going to do something um, amusing, we can rewrite p squared as minus grad squared, okay? Because grad squared on e to the i p x just pulls down a minus p squared. So minus grad squared pulls down p squared. So this is vacuum integral d q p two pi q square root of m squared minus grad squared over 2 omega p. And just let me write ditto, okay, because I'm, I'm not changing any of that. Um, well, it's actually not quite ditto because um, there's, a, there's a minus here and Actually, I'm just a little puzzled here because we've got I holds down an omega here, and so we have a minus sign there. So if I put this back in, I, I seem to have a minus sign in this here. E to the I, minus a dagger p in the ipx sign. Um, I want to say that this is, oh, it's okay. It's okay because a dagger annihilates vacuum from the left, from the right. So this thing is in fact zero, it's just this one. And so this thing is square root of m squared minus grad squared on vacuum uh, the field of x and t and the state sign. Or in other words, what we've got here is i d by dt psi of x 
is square root of m squared minus grad squared psi of x. Now we approximate that, since m squared is big, this is m minus grad squared over 2m psi of x. Now you recognize this is Schrodinger's equation with a better formula for energy. In other words, the real formula for energy here is mc squared and then the kinetic term. mc squared plus the kinetic term. Mm -hmm. Now, let me uh, switch notes and go to my new notes. Good. So let's see. Yes? I'm confused in this last step here, how you're able to, you, you, so you're able to say something was zero, that the A dagger was zero. Okay, hold on a second. But, uh, but the, um, but that's still not, since you don't have that, that term that went to zero, how is that uh, R, R phi now? How can we still label it as phi since that term's gone? I mean, that is, it was negative. This is just the field. The state is sum. Uh -huh. But so A, A, P. Um, the point is that A, the point is that if, if you have, in other words, if you have vacuum A, P dagger psi, well, this is just zero because it's the Hermitian right, right, conjugate of psi right, right, AP right. zero, and that's just yeah. Zero. But I'm just saying, don't, don't you have to have AP and AP, and AP dagger to identify this uh, phi? Don't you have to have no, what is the field? Well, field the point is, is that phi, oh. the, the the creation part of phi is zero when you take the matrix element with vacuum on the left. Yeah, doesn't contribute. So you, you, I guess you can have it there or not have it there. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. I'm just identifying what five was Travis answered. Hmm? Travis, it's just, uh, I, Travis answered it, but you should identify what five is in this. It's, I get it. All right, I mean, the point is that if you, whenever you take the matrix element of the field, the zero on the left, the creation part doesn't contribute. All right, now, um, what I'm about to do, let us say, it, or we can do this with either, yes? But the Schrodinger equation has a, huh? the Schrodinger equation has a potential term to it. Oh, well, so, I mean, how do you, how do you, no, 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 good, no, yeah, no, you're, 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 you want a candy? All right. Um, you're, of course, right. Um, but then one would have had, we would have had to have a more complicated uh, Hamiltonian. And uh, then the more complicated Hamiltonian, um, so the this potential is, term so would have come in. This is just the this is just the free theory, and it's yeah. and and that's because this is a great question though. That's because in order to derive it, I said I side dot is, and what did I get? I just got an omega. That's just the free energy, right? If we were doing this more accurately, we would have had a potential term in there somehow. OK. Now what I want to do is I want to show that the equal time commutator of two fields, or a field itself, vanishes. and. Um, this, once again, will be a double function as your friend calculation. In fact, let me um, put in the thing about field, just as a, just, um, as a an interesting story. The fear part of our brain is the fast part of the brain. And the fast part of the brain, the, of the human brain, is not all that different from the fast part of the lizard brain. Um, and um, that's why fears are sometimes quite stupid. The reason why it has to be part of the fast part of the brain is that if you see a, uh, a, a car coming at you, you have to jump out of the way immediately. You can't say, let us see. <laughs> uh, that particle, that field, has, that, that car has momentum, let us say, one ton times a certain speed, 40 miles an hour. 
And when we see if I can work that out in round numbers, and then of course you're dead. Um, so the, the, the fast part of the brain just says jump out of the way and think later. Anyway, um, but the fast part of the brain, because it has to act very fast, can't be very smart. And it isn't. Um, and an example of this, um, uh, a couple of examples that I've read about in a lovely book by, I can't remember the guy's name, Jared Diamond, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he told a story of um, some anthropologists who were working in Africa. And they were working in a particular village where there were no roads. And the men in the village would go out and um, if they saw that a pack of lions had killed an animal, they'd go out and they'd stand some distance from the lion and they'd wait until the lions had eaten about as much as they needed to eat. In other words, until the lions were full. Then they'd come and charge the lions with spears and drive them away. Okay? That, and then they'd bring the carcass back to the village and share it with the rest of so the anthropologists took these men into the village where there was a road, and they saw cars going on the road, and they were petrified of the cars. They wouldn't even cross the road when they could see there was no car coming. <laughs> um, he told another story in his book about um, a family, again, of anthropologists, this time in uh, Brazil or something. And they had a daughter who um, every day would walk through a jungle on her way home from school or her way to school. And uh, of course, the jungle, you had all kinds of crazy insects, snakes, wild animals, and everything. And she just walked through it. I don't know how she got through it without being attacked by some beastie. But anyway, she did. Then um, they sent her to high school or college or something in Switzerland. Okay, so there she was with her classmates. And her classmates, of course, would skip across the street. They'd look both the ways and shoot across the street from no cause The girl though, from Brazil refused to do that. She would walk to the corner where there was a light. She'd wait for the green light and then walk very carefully across and would not jaywalk the wall across against the principal. Uh, anyway, it's an example of fear. Another example of fear, by the way, is um, we have, because we get most of our electricity from coal, we have global warming and air pollution. In China, it kills <coughs> hundreds of thousands of people every year die of air pollution. And uh, yet, what are the people in China afraid of? They're afraid of nuclear power, and they're opposed to the governments building nuclear power. And the same thing is true in the States. People are, <laughs> people are afraid of nuclear power, and uh, it, it's, it's a, the death rate from air pollution 10,000 here instead of only places. We have cleaner air, thanks, oddly enough, to Richard Nixon. And <laughs> of course, I mean, Obama has helped. All right, anyway, the equal time commentary with us. Let me start this. So we have phi of x. In fact, let me just set t equal to 0 so we simplify the algebra. T of x, phi of y, commutator. So we have integral dqp, 2 pi cubed, dqk, 2 pi cubed, 1 over square root of 2 omega p, 2 omega k. Okay. Then what's left is the main thing, which is a p, and then we have e to the i p dot x. It's just the three vector part because I've set the times equal to zero. All right, so that's the thing we want to evaluate. And so we have a p with a k zero, a dagger p, a dagger k zero, but a p with a dagger k non zero, and a dagger p, a k non, uh, non zero. 
All right, so what this turns out to be, let me just put the equal sign up here, it's integral dqp dqq to pi to the 6 square root of 2 omega p 2 omega k. And now what we have is e to the i p dot x minus i k dot y. And we have a p um, a k dagger plus e to the minus i p dot x plus i k dot y. Oh shit. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Well, it's again, you know, if I'm not looking at my notes, um, I switched from, all right, let me just make this a K. So then it's a, all right. And now we have uh, a P dagger, a K. Right. Okay. So once again, this gives us a delta function. And as I said, delta functions are your friends. Um, it's 2 pi cubed times the delta function. The delta function tells you whenever you have a k, let it be a p. All right. So, what do we get? What we get is, so there's a delta a plus delta function here, a minus delta function there. And so the, maybe I'll do this in two steps. P q p e cubed k, um, now 2 pi cubed, and uh, square root of 2 omega p, 2 omega k, and now we have uh, e to the i, p dot x minus i, p dot y, minus e to the minus i, p dot x plus i, p dot y, times delta cubed, e minus k. So the, P minus, the delta function forces, you, you do the integral over dqk, and you just replace k by p everywhere. By the way, if when you have these delta functions, if you actually have a derivative of a delta function, you just integrate by parts, and, 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 you get, and drop the surface terms, and then you have something that just involves a delta function. OK. Um, so, uh, what do we have now? We just set k equal to p. And so when we do that, we have dqp 2 pi q 2 omega p. And then we have here e to the i p x minus y minus e to the minus i p uh, x minus y. All right. But this um, p, well, Basically, uh, you're integrating over all of p, all of p space, and uh, what you do is when the p's are pointing this way, you use this one, but when they're pointing uh, the other way, they can take a minus sign, and uh, this, this is three vector p, of course, and um, so it cancels. If we're dealing with a massive case, then the energy omega p is indifferent to the sign of the three vector p. In fact, it doesn't even care about the angle. It just cares about the magnitude. So this is zero. So the field commutes with itself at uh, equal time. This is analogous to, imagine if you had a quantum mechanical system of um, many variables. So you would have commutation relations xi, xj at the same time they would be zero, or as you walk, we often say, we often call them Q, QI, QJ, zero. And then another relation, though, we would have, we would have XI, PJ is I, delta IJ, or equivalently, QI, PJ is I, delta IJ. Okay, so for say, the particles in three dimensions, or two particles in three dimensions, then you'd have six variables. Is there a question? Yeah. So if you interpret the field as creating particles at specific positions, 
Yeah. And then this result says that we can create particles that are arbitrarily far apart, which sort of seems to be a kind of a scary, not local enough phenomenon. So you mean that you mean that the same field at different space points creates particles at different space points? Right. Yeah. That's the way it is, yeah. All right, so that's the equal time commutator. And by the way, this equal time commutator also vanishes for interacting field theories. So the equal time commutator always vanishes. The idea is that just because of relativity, if you have two different space points at the same time, they can't uh, interfere with each other. OK, now the next thing is what about the time derivative? Well, we're going to set pi of x, and again, we're setting t equals 0, effectively, as the time derivative of the field at t equals 0. And so I'm going to suppress t. All right, well, let's compute what this is. So we compute uh, d by dt of phi of x and t. So this is d by dt of this integral dq p 2 pi q root 2 omega p. And then we have a p e to the i t dot x minus i omega p t. And by the way, one often writes that and says p0, x0. Although it's better, the reason why Schwartz does omega p is you see p0 could be the energy or it could just be some other variable, you know, uh, p0, not related to p in some specific, it could be independent of p. And it is in some cases. That's called off shell or virtual. E to the minus i p dot x plus i omega p t. Right. And we're going to take the time derivative of that. Well, it's pretty simple. What it does is it just pulls down a minus i omega here and a plus i omega there. And so this is integral p q p two pi cubed. So we have square root of omega p over two. And now we have minus i. AP, and now I'm saying t equals zero, so this is just e to the i p dot x uh, plus i a dagger p to the minus i p dot x. Okay, so that's what, this is what pi is. So pi of x at, at time zero is that. And so now we want to check that we get what we want is phi of x, phi of y. We want that to be like this. We want it to be like i delta ij, but that would be i delta of x minus y. And these delta functions are, um, I want to say three-dimensional, but they're delta functions of all three variables. All right, so let's compute this thing. We've, um, I'm going to pull out the minus i. So we've got minus i integral dqp 2 pi cubed, dq q 2 pi cubed, 1 over the square root of 2 omega p, square root of omega q over 2. And now we've got this commutator. And the commutator is AP in the I P dot X plus AP dagger in the minus I P dot X. So that's the, that's the phi part. And then the pi part, apart from the minus I, is AQ in the I Q dot X minus A dagger Q 
and then minus psi q.x. So it's this commutator, once again, it's only AP with AQ dagger and AP dagger with AQ that contribute. And so let me skip one line. Um, we have AP with minus AQ dagger, so that will be 2 pi Q minus 2 pi Q delta Q P minus Q. And so I'm going to rework. Sorry. Lots of cactuses. Um, all right. So I'm pulling out the, well, we've got the I, but we've got a minus sign from that commutator. So we have I integral dqp dqq. This is a 2 pi cube that I used up. Omega q over 4 omega p delta p minus q. And what's left is then e to the i px minus i qx, so the, oh, qy, hey, this is a y. Why? Why is it a y? Because it's a y here. That's why it's a y. All right. So this is then um, e to the i p dot x minus i dot y. And the other term is plus e to the minus i p dot x plus i p dot y. So in other words, this with that had a minus sign explicitly. This with that has a minus sign because it's a dagger a instead of a a dagger. In both cases it's a minus sign which cancels that minus. So now, we are, our friend, the delta function is here. That allows us to do, I mean, this is why it's your friend. This would be a six-dimensional integral. Good luck. Um, but because of the delta function, this integration is trivial. You just replace q and p everywhere. And what you get is i integral dqp 2 pi q, the omegas cancel, we just get a one half e to the i p x minus y plus e to the minus i p x minus y. Well, this is the, one of the famous representations of the delta function. dqp over 2 pi q, e to the i p x minus y, that's delta q of x minus y. And so is this. And so all together we have I delta Q X minus Y. Is there a factor of two? The factor of two is because it's a one oh. half here. Sorry. I had to that. You want a can? No. Not for, the fa not for a factor of two. It's not fair. <laughs> factors of two, oh God. I kill for a factor of two. Um, All right, now, um, let me say that, and this may be a homework problem, but let me just tell you what the answer is. Pi of xt, pi of y and t, equal time is zero. So the equal time commutator of two pi's is zero. And again, it's basically relativity. You can't get a signal from x to y in, with no time. Now, um, in ordinary quantum mechanics, what we say is you can't measure the position of a particular variable, a particular position variable, xi, and the corresponding momentum at the same time. That's what this means. And there's an h bar there, which I snuffed out in natural units. Over here, it says you can't measure the field and its time derivative at the same space point at the same time. All right, all right, let me go to the front. 
Now, if you have a general, a more general theory, um, then, uh, as I said, the, by and large, the change. So, why don't you swing this link and you swing this around? If you have a more general theory, the difference basically is that the annihilation creation operators have an extra time dependence. There's the harmonic time dependence that's built in here a uh, minus i omega p t, but then there's an extra anharmonic time dependence. And so that's what the general, that's how it looks in a general theory. Um, but still, the equal, in the general theory, equal time commutators of fields vanish at different space points equal time, or the same space point, because it's trivial, it's just phi squared minus phi squared. And the commutator of phi of x and t with pi of y of t in general is i delta cubed x minus y. Um, all right, and so um, Schwartz then says uh, that you can think of quantum field theory as uh, the quantum mechanics of an infinite number of harmonic oscillators. I think he should have said as an infinite number of anharmonic oscillators, because these oscillators in the interacting theory will have are not going to be harmonic; they're going to be anharmonic. All right, the next uh, topic is something very brief, and um, so I, uh, unfortunately the notation is a little bit clumsy, so it's going to take me more time to write it than to almost than it's worth, but the, the idea that I want to the idea here is that if you think of um, the electromagnetic field and let us say one polarization, you can think of it then as sort of a scalar field, massless scalar field, and sort of. And um, if we then do the quantum mechanics using what we using a sort of scalar field theory formulation, then we get this equations that we sort of guessed at in, in the first chapter. Um, and as I said <coughs> um, to you once before, if you do ordinary quantum mechanics together with the electromagnetic field treated properly, then um, you can compute uh, the transition rates of um, uh, absorption and emission and spontaneous emission and stimulated emission. And they're quite nice calculations. They're among the nicest, I think they are the nicest quantum mechanical examples or examples of quantum mechanics. Okay, so what we're thinking of is H is some H0 plus some H interaction. H0 is H for the atoms plus H for the photons, so I'll write I'll write it, I'm trying to abbreviate, otherwise it's so long. H for the photons is, of course, integral dqk, 2 pi q, omega k, ak dagger, ak, plus a half. Although you have to sum also all the polarizations, but we're ignoring spin and polarizations and everything. Now, Fermi was to invent so many things, um, has his golden rule, and this thing is, for some reason, it's a capital gamma, I don't know why. Inter it's, it's in a product of the uh, interaction Hamiltonian, the initial state, absolute squared, delta, EF minus EI. So that's Fermi's golden rule, that the rate's proportional to that, and um, 
H int, we're just going to take it to be phi times some atomic H. And what this actually is in, in real life, this is essentially P dot A over M times E, E the charge of the electron in suitable units. Um, and A is the electromagnetic field as a feedback vector, but um, we're just going to think of it as phi. So we're going to think of it as phi times some atomic thing like P. All right, so what is M1 goes to 2? Well, it's the atom excited, one less photon, H interaction, atom, N photons, and this is going to be proportional to atom excited, the atom uh, variables, which is essentially P or X dot or something, times atom, but then square root of NK, because this was an annihilation operator, and an annihilation operator on a state of N photons gives square root of NK. On the other hand, M2 goes to 1, well, this is atom de-excited, NK plus 1, H int, atom excited, NK, and this is proportional to atom HI, and of course HI is emission, atom uh, excited, and then this one would be square root of, well, it's a creation operator, so it's NK plus 1. And um, so basically we're recreating uh, equations uh, 1.27 and 1.31. And uh, you see that this is the complex conjugate of that. So in a sense, we're just sort of rederiving it from there. But uh, let me tell you, if um, we had time, or perhaps when you took a course in quantum mechanics, um, your teacher may have done the interaction of light with matter. As I said, it's one of the nicest things in um, quantum any questions? We have a little time and I'm about to shift to chapter three in a very different topic. Today's Wednesday. There's no class Monday really true? But now, now, final energy, what do we mean here? In this particular case, it's the energy of the atom, unexcited plus n photons, has to be the same as the energy of the excited atom and the energy of n minus 1 photons. Yeah. Good question. Let me give you a candy. Um, I have two doors at home. One of them can catch anything I throw at them. The other one, it was. And in fact, I once, I once threw a piece of cheese to this door. And you know, I threw it right at her head. And instead of opening the mouth and grabbing the cheese, she ducked and hit her back. And then she couldn't get it on her. And she tried to lick, and she tried to lick that way, and just couldn't get it. And this went on for five minutes. I actually filmed it with a, you know, an iPhone or something. And then two or three minutes later, another dog um, that I had walked in, and this dog just walked in, licked it off her back, and walked past her. <laughs> it wasn't. It was just um, so fast. It was hysterical. I put it up on YouTube. I don't know if it's up there or maybe one of my sons did. All right.
we're now going to do some <laughs> classical field theory. This is very important, actually, and it's also very, uh, very nice. Uh, classical field theory has some very attractive features, and in fact, um, in the 19th century, it was too attractive, and many physicists thought that it was everything, and these atoms that the chemists thought about were, um, they thought about the, they thought the atoms, they thought about the atoms the way people in the early 60s thought of quarks. And in fact, when I first came to this department, nobody knew quarks. Um, in, in the department. <laughs> All right, H. This is an integral of a Hamiltonian density p cubed x. Lagrangian, so this is a Hamiltonian. This is an integral of an action density p cubed x. And the action is the time integral of the Lagrangian. Okay. And action has energy as units of energy times time, which is like H1. All right, now usually R, if we're talking about a scalar field, then we have, it's just a, 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 a function of the field and its time derivative, or actually it's not really just that. It's the field and its space-time derivatives. That's what, um, the, that's what we will normally think of the uh, action density as. And we'll say that pi, and now I'm talking, this is classical. This is partial of the action density with respect to the time derivative of the field. And we, look, and we have that the Hamiltonian normally is pi phi dot uh, minus L. Okay. Now these are actually Legendre transforms, and um, let me just write them, phi, um, say da phi, is pi of phi da phi times phi dot minus h of phi pi of phi da phi. And now you see L is independent of pi, so we say 0 is partial L partial pi, but doing that we get phi dot minus partial h partial pi, so phi dot is partial h partial pi. And then the other one, the other Legendre, the inverse Legendre transform is h of phi and pi is um, pi phi dot of phi and pi uh, minus, well, there should be a phi pi and d and the space derivatives, let us say, rad phi minus um, L of phi, uh, let us say, da of uh, phi and d, well, Oh, okay. all right, so this is a little bit clumsy. Well, it's just going to be L anyway. So it's phi, phi dot of uh, phi grad phi and pi and, and grad phi. All right. So it's all that. Now what we have is Zero is partial of h with respect to phi dot, and that gives us pi minus partial L partial phi dot. And so we have then this equation tells us that pi is partial of the action density with respect to the time derivative of the field. And if we had many fields, it would be the same razzmatazz. You just have I's and J's and so forth. 
All right, so that's um, that's basically the uh, the yes. So classically, when you do a classical field, are they three components or are they still four? I'm sorry, when you have a classical field? Are they like just space or is it still space-time? The, the classical field depends upon space and time. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Is that the... Yeah, is it three component or four components? Yeah, it, it depends upon space and time. All right, now let me try to go a little bit further. Um, before we run out of time. Oh, all right, just an example. And this is, this is an important example because when we're talking scale fields, we almost never consider anything else. All right, so this is a very important example. It's almost a whole story. A half d mu phi d mu phi minus v of phi. Now, in simpler terms, what is this? With Schwartz's metric, this is a half phi dot squared minus a half grad phi squared minus uh, whatever v of phi is. Pi is partial L, partial phi dot. Well, what is that? It's nothing more than pi dot. So, generally, we have in mind that pi is phi dot. And, of course, you don't want to always have pi being phi dot, because in particular, when you go to the Hamiltonian, you have pi phi dot minus L. But what you're supposed to do now is express phi dot in terms of pi, well here it's trivial, phi dot is pi simply. And so this is equal to pi squared minus L expressed in terms of pi, grad phi, and phi. And so this is minus a half pi squared plus a half grad phi squared plus V of phi. So this cancels a little bit, and we have h is a half pi squared plus a half grad phi squared plus v of phi. All right, we interpret this then as the, uh, well, the various ways of interpreting it. You say this is the kinetic term, and this is the potential, or you can say these two together are the kinetic term, and this is the potential. And uh, in, 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 in an, often, uh, in, in a simple case, uh, h could be a, a half pi squared plus a half grad phi squared plus a half m squared pi squared. This is a free theory of mass m. Uh, it's a classical field theory of mass m. Now, of course, when you had, uh, when people were doing classical field theory, they didn't have any mass m because they weren't talking about, they didn't think that, that fields represented particles. In fact, the breakthrough there was um, some work Einstein did in actually biophysics. He, um, derive a relationship between measurable quantities and Boltzmann's constant. And the gas constant is basically Boltzmann's constant times Avogadro's number. People knew what the gas constant was. Einstein's biophysical equation, which related things like viscosity to the temperature and Boltzmann's constant, let them compute doesn't measure Boltzmann's constant. Once they had Boltzmann's constant, the gas constant, they could compute Avogadro's number. Once they had Avogadro's number, well, they, the chemists were saying for years that that uh, six that Avogadro's number of oxygen <coughs> molecules weighs 16 grams. So all of a sudden, they knew that one molecule 
was 16 grams divided by whatever the hell Avogadro's number was, but until Einstein showed that there was actually a value, they didn't, many physicists regarded Avogadro's number as just so much uh, chemical uh, BS. Um, well, we're just about at the, uh, so let me see, I think. Okay, so these Legendre transforms, they work very nice in this simple case where the uh, action is quadratic in the, in the time derivative, say. Then it, it works very simply. In more complicated cases, it doesn't, uh, this whole procedure of getting the Hamiltonian from the action density uh, can get very complicated. Um, I could give you one ex example, but I might run over by, all right, I promise not to go over by more than one minute. All right, one minute. Here is a particular uh, action density. m to the fourth times one minus the square root of 1 minus m to the minus 4 pi dot squared minus grad phi squared minus m squared pi squared. Suppose that's our action density. This one actually is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an example that is pretty easy to solve. All right, what do we get? We get the pi is phi dot, you know, just differentiating. Pi is phi dot divided by one minus m to the minus four pi dot squared minus grad phi squared minus m squared phi squared. Right. That's pi. And phi dot, and this is sort of, this is not, can't just say phi dot is pi times that square root because the square root involves phi dot. So you have to actually solve. And you get pi over square root of 1 plus m to the minus 4 pi squared, square root of 1 plus m to the minus 4 grad phi squared plus m squared pi squared. So that's pretty complicated. But you can compute the Hamiltonian, and it's not so bad. Um, let me see if I can write it down really quickly. I don't know where to go. The Hamiltonian density, then, is square root of m to the fourth plus pi squared m to the fourth plus grad phi squared plus m squared phi squared minus m to the fourth. So that's not so bad. That's a case that kind of works. But, but this business of um, going from the action density to the uh, to the Hamilton, to the Hamilton, to the energy density, or from the energy density to the Hamilton, to the action density, in general, is very hard. Uh, like, any questions? All right, let's stop.